Okay, one of the things uh, I discovered when I was going around doing my road shows was a lot of the members had asked whether I could put the, road, uh, the presentation on a video on a website and hence the reason that it's being recorded today. So before I go on to discuss what we're going to, uh, going to speak about uh, during the course of the video, one of the things I wanted to pick up on first was the badge. Going around the country, lots of people didn't realise the symbolism behind the badge. The marketing committee had given the design consultants a brief and the brief included that the heart shape should remain and that the colours uh, should be incorporated within the badge. So the new badge, when you look at it, the top left hand corner of the gold part is to symbolise the new membership. The right hand bottom corner where it's in blue is to symbolise the current membership and the gold band round the badge is to symbolise women together. So there was a bit of thought went into the badge. It wasn't just picked. The marketing committee who selected the design were faced with uh, I think 16 to 20 choices and the badge was what they uh, eventually decided upon. So why were the road shows? Why are we doing this? Well I've done a number of the road shows now and part of the reason was for communication. Within the organisation it's very difficult to communicate with people, particularly when you don't know who the people are or where they live or how to contact them. So, so that the same message got delivered across Scotland to all the federations and it was delivered in the same way because sometimes when you send stuff out from headquarters it's better hearing it in person because sometimes the message gets lost or is not delivered uh, in the way that it's meant. The other part of it is the, the opportunity to uh, ask me questions. Clearly, during the video, you will not have that opportunity, but during the road shows, uh, people have been asking me lots of questions. And it's to dispel some of the myths that are happening within the organisation and also to explain to you why it was change necessary and what the future direction of the organisation uh, is going in and the decisions that your elected representatives are making on your behalf. So as we look at the uh, figures for the organisation, when I came in uh, I looked at the, the membership going, pa going back to 1982 and you'll see from the graph that the membership in 1982 was about 48,500 members and this has declined uh, year on year to 2016 when we had 16,090 members. And indeed the figures for 2017 show that we've uh, dropped uh, from that figure. So the organisation was in decline and had been for decades. So the, the office bearers were left with uh, a decision to make whether they actually wanted to uh, move the organisation forward and in order to do that change was necessary because the organisation basically has never changed in decades. So it was faced with the prospect of either closing or trying to attract a new demographic. So from the figures, uh, the actual figures are projected forward to 2025 and you'll see from the graph that the decline will continue. And in 2025, the membership will be 7,300. So what we have to do is that as the membership declines, we all need to work together to try and uh, at least halt the decline or if possible reverse the decline in order to prevent the organisation from closing. Because with 7,300 members, the organisation is at risk of not being able to uh, continue in its current form or carry out its core activities or indeed will need to radically alter what it offers uh, for its members. Now, when I came in I noticed that uh, the Her Majesty's Inspector of Education had carried out an inspection of the organisation because we used to get a grant from the Scottish Government as part of our charitable activities providing education and training. And when I read the report from 1993 it had some interesting comments and you'll see in the slide some of them. One of the, the things that they picked out was there was no marketing strategy for the organisation and no marketing budget. There was a need to develop a marketing strategy for the movement as a whole. I also said interestingly if the SWRI is to survive and thrive in the next century it must consider its current practices and overall image 
including its name. I also said the ultimate solution in decline in membership and to the future develop, development of the organisation lies with its membership and in particular with the effectiveness of its headquarters operations and national office bearers. I also said the SWRI should plan strategically in collaboration with all relevant external agencies and to prepare the organisation for the next century. Now, hindsight is an exact science, but what I could find is that when this report was done, the organisation had 33,604 members. It currently has less than half of that. And between 1993 and last year, or until the change, the rebrand, I can't find anything substantial that the organisation did to reverse, or try and reverse the decline. They put out a survey in 1996, and surprisingly, the respondents in the survey, a proportion of them, a significant proportion of them, suggested that the organisation should drop the word brutal from its title and adopt, adopt a new image. So that sets the background of why change uh, was necessary. When we look at life, rebranding is a fact of life. We've got driverless cars, mobile phones, and coming along is electric cars. And indeed, if Richard Branson gets his way, we're going to have a hydro, hydro loop from Edinburgh to London. We'll be able to travel by train and get there in 45 minutes, travelling at 540 miles an hour, and a big long tube. These things, whilst uh, seem fantasy, are actual fact being plan planning for and could become a reality. So the organisation has to adapt, has to change in order to try and keep up with the pace of life. When we did rebrand, there was a number of letters went to Oscar. In fact, Oscar, the chap at Oscar and I became very good friends due to the correspondence that he was receiving. But one of the things in relation to the rebrand was Oscar said, becoming an owner's name, they did not have any decision in that process, or indeed uh, it was basically a rebrand, it wasn't a change in the constitution. So I'd asked Oscar to put in writing what uh, their advice was, and you'll see from the slide, the charity did not need to obtain Oscar's prior consent for this change. Since there was no consent decision to be made, we undertook no consideration, consideration of the charity's powers to make the change. Interestingly, when I came into the organisation, the organisation was known as the Scottish Women's Rural Institute, known as SWRI. All the marketing committee in the organisation did was to change from Scottish Women's Rural Institute, known as SWI. It wasn't a substantial change, but in order to change, it allowed them to rebrand and adopt a new strap line and badge. So whilst we were talking about some of the negatives, it's not all negative, there have been positives uh, come out of the, the change. And we have established new institutes in Aberdeen, Fife, Motherwell, Falkirk, Baldernock. You'll have heard of the Dean Divas in Aberdeen, and they have other subgroups within the Dean Divas called the Walking Divas, the Crafty Divas, and the Book Divas, ladies who want to take part in some or all activities, who dip in and dip out. We also have the new institute of Motherwell, the Ladies of Steel, set up in the former steel town of Motherwell. And these ladies are a broad mix of ages. And we have new ones started in September 17 in Falkirk and Bildermot. We have interest shown in Glasgow, Ayrshire, Edinburgh and Perth, and indeed you have seen the chairman uh, initiative in Perth where young people have become involved and they're called the Young Dippers. They've been mentoring by the ladies of the SWI. You also see that a similar group has started in Caithness, teaching younger people the craft skills that the ladies possess. We're also looking at junior membership for those under 16 and this will form part of the Constitutional Review. Since January 2017, we've been sending out new membership packs for members. So if a new member joins your institute and your institute 
contacts us with the details of the new member and we send out a membership pack welcoming them to the organisation. Now you'll see from the slide that 303 membership packs have been issued since January. In actual fact it's well over 330 now. So it shows there's still a demand for the organisation and ladies are still joining. The other aspect is membership cards. They get membership cards and the intention was through the, the membership forms, once we receive the information, we were going to send each member a membership card and part of that was in developing an affinity scheme with suppliers in order to negotiate a discount on behalf of our members. One of the first companies I approached and uh, who agreed was Barhead Travel. They would offer you a discount in the holidays, they'd offer you a staff discount and some other aspects of their business, a discount in insurance, a discount in uh, foreign currency. So those ladies who produced the membership card would access those discounts. However, there is an issue in relation to the membership cards and one of that uh, is, and I'll touch on the membership forms later, but in order to issue the membership card, the membership form talks about the data protection uh, box at the bottom and whether you tick the box yes or no. If you tick the box yes, that means that we can share the information with other members of the organisation. If you tick no, then we can't. What we can't do is share it with any other member outside the organisation as there is no third party part mentioned in that data protection statement. As a consequence of that, that has limited us to producing the membership cards because normally companies can do this for us. They can issue the cards, they can issue the letters that goes with the cards and we sign a non-disclosure agreement with them once they have your names and addresses and once they've sent out the membership cards then the data is destroyed. However, because the box has been restricted so much because of your fears, then the organisation can't do that. So the only way that can issue membership cards is for it to do it in-house. And this is the thing that your executive committee in November last year have agreed to. However, it's going to take a significant amount of work by the staff in order to achieve this. And this will happen hopefully during the course of this year. So what the, the membership and the brand, new rebranding has shown is that there's still a desire by ladies to meet in towns, cities and island communities. Indeed this is borne out by the latest figures that we have in our returns in November. Because it would appear that 425 new members have joined the organisation. Some more positives. The online joiner scheme, which you may be aware of, where a member can pay £40, join online, they then have the ability to visit the institutes within the first year and then decide which institute they will join and then become uh, a member of that institute and pay the institute fees, the federation levy and the national levy. The online joiners receive a magazine each month and we've had 137 joined thus far, although that figure has increased uh, slightly as well. I also receive every inquiry that goes to the Federation through the website and to the office. And we've had over 500 now inquiries of ladies wishing to join the organisation. And as I said earlier, there's clearly still a demand for ladies to join. So we know that there's still an interest. There's also a new type of membership, an associate membership. An associate membership is for those ladies whose institutes have closed and maybe they have to travel a greater distance to, to join another institute but still wish to remain part of the organisation. So there is an associate membership scheme available. Clearly that's a bit more expensive than joining normally because otherwise if we made it cheaper then everyone would become an associate member and no one would do any work. So the cost of that is £55 and for that they get the magazine and are allowed to take part in national competitions. The other thing that's come online, as you'll notice, is the online shop. When I come into the organisation there's a bit of resistance to taking car payments and we're swamped with cheques. But the online shop, when we developed this, has proved a great success because it enables ladies to go onto the, uh, the website 
and purchase items and not be limited to doing it between 9 and 5 or when the office is open. They can do it online at night in the comfort of their own home and pay by card. Indeed, we've had a lady who ordered 300 Sanka glove patterns from Japan. We've had ladies ordering glove patterns and items from America, Australia. So the online shop has proved a success and has increased the merchandise sale. You also notice on, on in the members' website the minutes. Now the minutes for the meetings are normally sent out to the Federation Secretaries and Central Councils and those on the committees so that they're distributed down. What I've now done is put them on the website so that those members who wish to look at the minutes can see them. The only thing that's not on the website is the finance minutes and that's quite clearly for obvious reasons. It's dealing with our investments and we don't necessarily wish that information uh, in the wider public. The other thing I'm going to talk to you in this slide is the magazine rebrand. The magazine has, from, uh, has continually declined as a proportion of membership. And indeed, we must be the only membership organisation who produces a membership magazine that the members have a choice whether they get it or not. As a consequence of that choice, the organisation's uh, finances in relation to the magazine is in decline. We only produce less than 3,500 magazines per month and as a consequence of that the cost increases when you're producing so few. The only way around this is if the magazine continues to, to decline and lose money the communications committee have a decision to make and that decision is whether they actually produce the magazine at all, whether they produce it less frequently or whether the organisation takes a decision, like every other membership organisation that produces a magazine, that the members, once they pay the subscription of their levy, should get a copy. If everyone wants to take a copy, then the cost through economies of scale will reduce. It would also ensure that all the information that we wanted our members to receive arrives in your letterbox, as opposed to being cascaded down. But that's a decision for the Communications Committee and ultimately for the, the, the organisation as a whole. But what is quite clear is that the magazine is failing. You're in deficit and will continue to be in deficit. Which brings us on to the next slide and with the Constitution. The Constitution, when I came into the organisation, had, had been revamped slightly in 2009 but not to any great extent. And the Constitution Committee has been formed and they're made up of members and they're being advised by Janet Hamblin who advised the National Trust on their governance. Because I think as a charity we must be one of the very few charities in Scotland whose board of trustees who are in fact just central councils, number 55 in number. That's not efficient and it's not effective. A board of a charity should normally consist of eight and ten, between eight and ten. And indeed the WI in England, who have 220,000 members, their board, I believe, consists of ten people. Our board consists of 55 people. You can also bring two observers to the meeting and two additional observers, which means even with 55 they can't hold it in the office. But the last central council in May with 108 people there, and the attendant cost of that higher premises, paying travel, and occasions paying overnight accommodation, and lunch, tea, coffee. There isn't another charity in Scotland that has that level of governance in their charity board, other than what was the National Trust, who had a board of 86, and the government forced them into change. They produced a document fit for purpose, and they had to change. Their board is now down to a management level and our organisation should do likewise because you can't run an organisation where strategic decisions are made once a year and indeed trying to get 55 people to develop strategy is almost impossible. So the constitution has been reviewed 
And once the ladies have finished reviewing the constitution, it will be out and everyone will have an opportunity to comment on it. And once that's done, then it will go through the normal channels for approval or not. The other thing is the SQA. One of the things I noticed when I came in was the organisation, the skills that the ladies have. Quite clearly, the potential of if the organisation fails, not being here. A wee bit like the shipyards, once they're gone, they're gone. So I looked at developing qualifications through the SQA. My next door neighbour was part of the expert panel who wrote the paper for the Scottish Government, post-16 vocational qualifications. And when I approached her, she thought the organisation was absolutely perfect to fit into that model that the Scottish Government had. Along with the chairman, I spoke to the Scottish Government, went to see the senior officials, and they agreed that uh, that was something that the organisation should pursue. Albeit with the carrot that we may get some funding. Something with the carrots pulled away from us and we're not getting any funding. However, that does not stop the idea of being a good one, in my view. However, we went to see the SQA and they agreed and the proficiency schedules can be adapted and we can offer higher national units uh, off the shelf and the candidates can present themselves through their organisation who would become an accredited centre and they'd be assessed, verified and the SQA would issue a certificate to the candidate if they passed. But what better way of meeting Catherine Blair's vision of if you know a good thing, pass it on. However, the Central Councillors in May decided to postpone it again for another year. So the decision's back into the long grass and we don't know where the organisation will take it from May this year. Which brings us on to SKEO. SKEO stands for Scottish Charitable and Cooperated Organisation. Now, the other thing I noticed when I started in the organisation was it's an unincorporated organisation, which means that your trustees, i.e. your central councillors, are personally liable. Like any organisation or company, they generally limit the director's liability as we go into limited company status. The charity has a similar opportunity because the charities Commission and indeed the Charity Regulator in Scotland developed the Scottish Charitable and Corporation to protect trustees. But in order to protect the trustees, I need a list of the members, hence the membership form, hence us asking you for the information, because I have to produce that to the Charity Regulator. If I can't produce a full membership list, the trustees will not be protected. And if the organisation in the future cannot meet its debts, then those trustees, whoever they are at that point, will have to put their hands in their pockets and pay the difference. The other thing in relation to the, the membership form and why we need a membership list is the auditors ask me every year if I can say that the income that we receive matches the number of members and we can't because we don't know we don't know who our members are we don't know where you live how to contact you and the auditor went to central council in may last year and told central council that they must be able to produce a list of members that they can match against income if we can't do that then the organization has the potential of the auditors failing to sign the accounts and therein will follow uh, the organisation having to write to Oscar and trying to explain why our auditors will not sign off the accounts. So the membership list is required for those two reasons. Which brings me to the marketing plan. The marketing plan is a thing that the organisation, when they were looking at change should have had in place. Uh, it was raised at the first meeting of the marketing committee, however, for one reason or another it wasn't taken on board. And a couple of years down the line, one of the ladies who was on the marketing committee, who indeed was a marketing, marketing director and lecturer in marketing, approached me and said that 
perhaps we should work on it together. After getting approval, we indeed uh, started that process. However, the lady has taken on well now and the marketing plan hasn't been finished. So the organisation will need to make a decision on how they want to progress that. But it should have been done uh, when the rebranding took place. Which brings me to the Constitution Review. The committee uh, have terms of reference. The terms of reference should have been available for all committees. However, the Constitution Committee, I wrote the terms of reference, they tweaked them and it was subsequently approved by the Executive. So what do the terms of reference say? Well, the Committee will review the written constitutions of the Scottish Women's Rural Institutes and make necessary recommendations. The subcommittee was established following a motion passed at annual conference in 2015 to review the constitution of the organisation to bring it into line with a modern day charity. The subcommittee will review and recommend changes in the constitution taking account of modern day charity governance. They will engage with the membership acting as a sounding board and ensure that as far as is reasonably practicable they understand the members' concerns and views. They will review the structure of the organisation, taking account of the roles, responsibilities and committee structures and make recommendations of the necessary changes to the Executive Committee. The subcommittee will look at the charitable aims and objectives and make necessary recommendations to reflect women in today's society. And the membership of the subcommittee will be made up of volunteers from the membership, reflecting the range of skills, experience and age. They will take professional advice as and when required to ensure that the aims of the organisation and changes are in line with current, with current charity law and governance. A membership of the committee will be for the period it takes to implement the recommendations. And finally, accountability. The subcommittee will be accountable through the national office bearers who will report to the executive committee of the SWI. The executive committee will review the work of the subcommittee on an ongoing basis. It will act as a two-way communication channel, taking cognizance of any suggestions and or changes that the membership indicate. The subcommittee will meet frequently and at such intervals to ensure that the work of the subcommittee progresses. The committee will meet at least on four occasions to ensure progress of the constitution review and the meetings will be chaired by the national chairman. Once the uh, constitution has been reviewed in its entirety, the Constitution will come out to federations and institutes for comment. Following that, it will come back in and the Constitution Committee will meet again to review those comments. And finally, it will go to the lawyers for them to uh, check over and make sure that the Constitution is, uh, meets all the legal requirements. What is, what is clear is that the organisation or change, change is difficult in any organisation, but change in an organisation that hasn't changed in decades is always difficult. But clearly the organisation is left with no choice. In its current format, it was failing. There is no guarantee that in changing the brand, the organisation will survive. But if they hadn't changed, the future was very clear. And unless we all work together, as I said at the beginning, to try and save the organisation, and to check, uh, save what Catherine Blair vision was, then the organisation's future is in trouble. Thank you.